turned out to be just that, a, a mega find. If we'd got live dinosaurs, we could time them like I've just timed this race. Warm-bloodedness is a wonderful adaptation. It carries a tremendous price, the price of eating all the time at fabulous rates. The Dinosaurs is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and the financial support of viewers like you. Dinosaurs have vanished from the face of the Earth. But from beneath the Earth, their bones still cast a spell luring paleontologists, tourists, and amateur bone hunters, even to such out-of-the-way places as Jordan, Montana. For the folks of Garfield County, prospecting for bones is a hobby that can get exciting at any moment. On Labor Day, 1988, Ranchers Tom and Kathy Wankel drove out into the Montana hills. Oh, I've always been a rock hound all my life. I've, I've um, loved arrowheads and about anything old, and I've always walked around looking at the ground. Well, that morning we had the good fortune of having babysitters for our kids, so we were on our own, and we wanted to get out early when the, the morning light seemed to be more productive. I had hiked around the low part of one set of hills and he'd went another way but we met at the top of one small hill and out of the corner of my eye I'd spotted a ridge bones and um, I don't know just I was shaking I remember that. After she dug it up a little bit you know and scratched around she got more and more excited and she said I think I hope this is a mega find. And it's turned out to be just that, a, a mega find, very important. Kathy Wangle had found an almost complete Tyrannosaurus rex, one of the rarest finds in the history of dinosaur studies. And now a crew of paleontologists from the Museum of the Rockies is painstakingly easing the skeleton out of its rocky cradle. like doctors, setting them in a protective plaster cast, and then digging the underside out one inch at a time. Crew Chief Pat Liege. You're looking at the top part of the skull. This is the back here, and this is the front where the snout would be. And this circle in here is where the left eye would have been, right here. The right eye would have been there. And this section here is an upper jaw called the maxilla, and you can see a tooth, very long tooth, extending out. It's just going right underneath the nasal of the skull. The skeleton lies twisted in the ground, just where the animal fell. But what did the beast look like when it was alive? In the past 50 years, one of the great triumphs of dinosaur studies has been to put flesh on the bones, and in so doing, to change much of what we thought we knew about these creatures.
This is Yale University's Peabody Museum, where John Ostrom is curator. I'd like to introduce you to the largest painting in the world. It portrays time over a span of about 350 million years from the Devonian period back in the Paleozoic all the way up to the end of the dinosaur era, the end of the Mesozoic. It's called the Age of Reptiles. Here is the old picture of dinosaurs. Pea-brained giants lumbering through lush tropical foliage, gorging themselves on leaves and grass. For years, the stereotype was magnificently represented by this mural. Since the 40s, when it was painted, a number of discoveries have been made, and new ideas have been thrown into the debate. And perhaps one of the most important discoveries was made by me. It was 1964. John Ostrom recalls that he had been digging for months in Low County, Montana, and not finding very much. Time had run out. His crew had packed up their equipment and were heading for their cars. You know, we've been looking for five years before we found anything as exciting as this. Close to where the cars were parked, Ostrom noticed something in the rock. Since his tools were already stowed away, he began to scrape the dirt with his fingernails. This is what he saw first. Startling. I, I couldn't believe what I was looking at. Notice the extraordinarily large claws, sharp, curved, clearly the hands of a predaceous animal. Uh, associated, found very close to this, uh, was this object, obviously a claw which I thought belonged to the hand because it looks very much like the claws on those fingers. But there was no place for it to fit. And I puzzled over that for some time, but we found the answer. Turns out that that claw didn't belong to the hand at all. In fact, it belonged to the foot. But then something more came to light in our quarry. And uh, I'll show you just a part of it. Bits and pieces of the tail encased in bundles of ossified tendons all along each right side, left side, underneath. This made the tail completely stiff, like a, what I picture as a balancing pole. It kept the animal, helped the animal keep its balance while it was using those sickles on its feet for killing whatever it was hungry for. Ostrom named the animal Deinonychus, terrible claw, a killing machine that came into being more than a hundred million years ago and used both hands and feet to snatch and rend its prey, keeping its balance by the remarkable adaptation in its tail. Nothing like the galumphing brutes in the Yale mural, but a speedy acrobat, a racer. Pontefract racetrack outside Leeds, England. This is where McNeil Alexander comes to figure out how fast a dinosaur actually could move. Back in the 70s, people were arguing whether the dinosaurs were lumbering monsters or formidable running machines. And it wasn't an easy question to answer because the dinosaurs are dead. If we'd got live dinosaurs, we could time them like I've just timed this race. Uh, the distance was a mile, 
The winner did it in 105 seconds. That's about 34 miles an hour. Now, we can't do it that way with dinosaurs, but maybe there's another way. Dinosaurs did leave behind one piece of solid evidence about their rate of speed, their footprints. This is one of the largest sets of dinosaur tracks ever found. They're preserved in a riverbed in Glen Rose, Texas. But how do you get from the tracks to an estimate of speed? Here they come, Meg. That's fine. Gordon, that's great. Alexander timed the speeds of different animals and then measured the stride length, the distance between footprints of each animal. That's three meters 30, 10 feet 10 inches. Next, he calculated the relationship between the stride length and the actual speed. But dinosaurs were huge. How could you compare them with horses any more than you could compare a horse with a dog? There she goes. Now, she's doing the fast canter. We've slowed her down a bit so that you can see better what's happening. And now we're going to get the dog moving, too. We're going to slow the dog down so that the dog is taking the same number of strides each second as, they, uh, as the horse. We've adjusted the time scale so that they're matching, but we haven't adjusted the scale of size yet. So what we're going to do now is we'll blow up the dog, make the dog the same size as the horse. And now they're moving in just the same sort of way. Imagine the dog with, uh, with a bit less hair on and with a rider on the back. And really, the dog is moving uh, just like a horse. Alexander discovered that all animals move as scale models of one another. That is to say, cats and camels, dogs and horses, look the same at the same speed. It even works for bipeds. Look at the hind legs of a horse. They have the same motion as a person running. By measuring the fossil bones, Alexander knows the leg length of a dinosaur. From the tracks, he can learn its stride length, and from that, he can calculate its speed. I looked round at the dinosaur tracks. I started off with uh, the really famous ones from Texas and worked out the speed of the big sauropod dinosaurs there. And oh dear, they were, they were slower than I am. Real slow human walking speed. But what about the sauropod's top speed? Speed takes power. That means the faster an animal runs, the stronger its legs have to be in relation to its bulk. By calculating the strength of dinosaur leg bones, Alexander was able to make some comparisons. An elephant can trot along at about 16 miles an hour. That was probably top speed for a patasaurus. A rhinoceros hits 20 miles an hour. Triceratops just might have been able to keep up. How fast could Tyrannosaurus move? Alexander thinks its bones were relatively weak. But there are no footprints with which to calculate its speed. He thinks it could have chased you at about 15 miles an hour. Others don't give you such good odds. They clock Tyrannosaurus at 20 miles an hour or more. Here in Arizona, in the Painted Desert, the Alexander formula is about to be applied. Grad student Grace Irby and paleontologist Jim Farlow are looking for a set of dinosaur footprints. 
They ought to be around here somewhere. Because paleontologist R.T. Bird reported in the 1930s that he'd seen them. Bird never wrote down the exact location. He did leave one clue, though, a snapshot of himself on the site. Paleontologist Scott Madsden, a colleague of Farlow's and Irby's, found the photograph in an old book. He recognized the rock formations in the background. This looks like a good match. Yeah, I think you're right. Bird's secret was out. Scott Madsen came out here. He ran into the same problem we've got right here now. He thinks he's got the site all lined up with the landmarks, but no tracks. Can't find any tracks anywhere. He thinks he's made a mistake, but what happened is that between times, you have sand blowing in here, getting washed in. Sand completely covers up the site, so you've got to do a pretty thorough site cleanup to get all this stuff off before you can see any of the footprints. This is a very lovely dinosaur footprint site because you get a lot of footprints of both large and small three-toed, two-legged dinosaurs here. And I really like dinosaur footprints. I've, I've worked on dinosaur skeletons. You can get a lot of information from them. But when you get right down to it, even the best dinosaur skeleton is a corpse. It's just some dead thing there. Whereas when you look down at those dinosaur trackways down there, you see where the animal goes one step after another. It's almost like a kind of time machine back into the days of the giant reptiles. These tracks belong to a theropod, a meat-eating dinosaur about the size of an ostrich. Okay, hang it down on the middle toe there. Farlow determines the animal's stride length. Okay, call that one. 313. 313. Okay, Jim. Okay. No, it doesn't. So how's that compare with what we got before? Well, the first was 312, the second measurement 314, and then the last one was 313. Close That's enough for government good. work, yeah. Okay, take the hip height. Now the Alexander formula. Y to the X, 1.17, change of sign equals 0.621, and we get the beast. Looks like he's just trotting along at around 11 miles per hour. Can you run that fast? No. Farlow has found some more tracks. These stretch him beyond his limits. A 25 mile an hour dinosaur dash, faster than the Olympic sprint champion. This, in turn, raises a new question. A hot-blooded animal, a lion, for instance, keeps its body temperature constant and is active even on cold nights when the external temperature is low. It does this by a process scientists call endothermy. A cold-blooded animal, by contrast, will be cold and inert when the air around it is cold and active only when its internal temperature is raised by the warmth of the sun. When the cool night air returns, back the animal goes to its resting state. Scientists call this ectothermy. Today, most fast-moving agile animals use endothermy. They are hot-blooded. But dinosaurs are supposedly reptiles, and reptiles are cold-blooded. So were dinosaurs hot-blooded or cold-blooded? A zoo is as good a place as any to find out.
paleontologist Bob Bakker. We're here in the uh, National Zoo, where they're about to feed fabulous furballs, that is, small mammals, hot-blooded animals. And the essence of being hot-blooded is eating, eating lots, eating all the time. If you're hot-blooded, your body furnace just churns up calories. Your dietary chores are just never done, never. Cold-bloodedness is a whole different thing. Um, good example, a meat-eating cat in the wild. Uh, how much does your Jeffrey's cat weigh about? Approximately eight pounds. Eight pounds, OK. Um, total weight of food you'd offer it? We offer week? between three to five pounds. Three to five, like, uh, OK. Here's five pounds of meat. That's um, a weekly ration for a small carnivorous mammal, small hot blood. Let's exchange the mammal for a lizard now, OK? Cold-blooded lizard on the same diet in the same habitat, a zoo or the wild, you would only need the corner of this. Less than a quarter of a pound, one twentieth as much meat per week for the lizard because it's cold-blooded. Warm-bloodedness is a wonderful adaptation, but it carries a tremendous price. The price of eating all the time at fabulous rates. The enormous difference in food intake between reptiles and mammals gives Bakker what he needs to test his idea about dinosaurs. Among hot-blooded predators, there's a definite ratio of predator to prey. If a predator is hot-blooded, it needs to eat 50 times its own weight a year to stay alive, with the result that among hot-blooded animals, 2% are predators, the rest are prey. A cold-blooded predator, on the other hand, such as a crocodile, needs to eat only five times its own weight a year to survive. So the percentage of predators to prey is higher. When you look at the dinosaurs that have been collected, what percentage are predators? A hot-blooded 2% or a cold-blooded 20%? Well, I'll tell you what the number is. The number is 1 to 3%. 1 to 3% of all the dinosaur tonnage is meat-eater, and that's a hot-blooded number. A hot-blooded reptile? Such a creature exists nowhere else in nature. And yet in one important respect, dinosaurs did indeed behave as though they were hot-blooded. They appear to have traveled great distances. No part of the world we know now was out of bounds to dinosaurs. Their remains turn up everywhere. Hadrosaurs in Japan. Protoceratops in Mongolia. Stegosaurs all the way from Europe to Africa. Huge sauropods everywhere in North and South America. And perhaps most significantly of all, Hadrosaurs and Ceratopsians in Alaska. The North Slope of Alaska, 100 miles above the Arctic Circle. Most of the year, it's a frozen wasteland. But for a month in summer, the temperature climbs as high as 40 degrees. A team of scientists has taken advantage of the relatively balmy weather to look for evidence that would help settle the debate over dinosaurs' body temperatures. suppose dinosaurs were hot-blooded. How could they have weathered the climate here? Most dinosaurs had no fur and no feathers to keep them warm. And what would they have eaten? Does anybody want any bagels? Yeah. Much depends on what the Arctic was like at the time, 90 million years ago. The researchers split into two parties. While one crew sets out to look for bones and more clues to the body temperature of dinosaurs, a second group, consisting of paleobotanists Judy Parrish and Bob Spicer, flies 100 miles downriver on the trail of a different quarry, fossil plants. I'll, uh, I'll go and prospect the plants. OK. Judy Parrish. This is a impression of a log that's uh, about 90 million years old. We can see the pattern of the wood. 
this may be an impression of the bark here. And uh, we can see that it was a large tree. We know from other samples of trees from this age rock that these trees had very wide growth rings. And what that tells us is that during the growing season, they grew very happily. Uh, tree rings have got usually light and dark bands. The light band is laid down when the tree is growing during the summer, and the dark band is laid down in the fall if the uh, growing season has a cool part to it. These trees don't have a dark band, or they have a very, very thin dark band, and that shows that they were growing very rapidly during the growing season and then stopped abruptly. And from the fossil leaves, Spicer and Parrish can deduce what the weather was like. Here in prehistoric Alaska, the temperature averaged about 50 degrees Fahrenheit. But could dinosaurs have survived in such a climate? One answer is visible right here, only 100 miles away, where the other party has been working. Over 1,000 dinosaur bones have been collected on this slope in the last 10 years. Paleontologist Andy Crumhart. This is the very bottom of the bone bed. And as you can see, there's just piles and piles of bones just all jammed together. It started, I hit this little tip of a bone right here. This is a scapula. That's your shoulder blade bone right here of a young individual. And in taking that out, I ran into bone on either side. There's a long fibula bone right here, which is a leg bone. There's a rib here, um, an arm bone here. I think another arm bone here, which is pretty well destroyed. It's, it's not in very good condition. It's gonna continue underneath me and continue that way. And I'm gonna have to take out some of the side here and some of this back here um, to probably finish it off. And no doubt it goes back into the bank as well. So in the summer, at least, dinosaurs were plentiful here and would have had enough sun and food to survive. The climate might have been no more severe than fall in Maine. But what about the winter, when the sun would shine as little as four hours a day? What did the dinosaurs do? Did they hibernate? If I was a dinosaur, I wouldn't want to stay up here during the winter. Three months of darkness and temperatures probably falling down to around about freezing point. So, like many modern caribou, for example, I think that the dinosaurs probably migrated. Probably in large herds, maybe hundreds or thousands at a time, moving north in the spring, following the, the spring flush of growth, spending the summer on the Arctic slope where Lots of food was to be had, and the daylight was constant. And then as the, the year waned and the winter came on, moving south again, following the food resources. Migrating herds of hadrosaurs and pachyrhinos would seem a strong argument for the hot-blooded dinosaur. It doesn't seem possible that a cold-blooded animal could muster the sustained energy to make a journey of hundreds of miles in almost freezing weather. But maybe they could. Dragon 2, this is Dragon 1. Dragon 2, this is Dragon 1. Come in, please. Tamarindo on Costa Rica's Pacific coast. Yeah, this is the North team. I'm uh, reaching the end of my uh, run, and I haven't seen any tracks yet. I think it's a little early. 
Jim Spatilla is an animal physiologist from Drexel University in Philadelphia. Along with his colleagues, he's looking for a leatherback turtle. The leatherback is the largest extant marine reptile, and every year it makes a 2,000-mile journey to tropical Costa Rica from cool northern Pacific waters to lay its eggs. Blooded reptile makes such a titanic sustained effort? Or is this turtle more like a mammal, hot blooded? If it is, we would have at least one instance of a hot blooded reptile, and the argument that dinosaurs were hot blooded would gain some support. But how do you tell whether a turtle is hot blooded? You measure its breath. From its breath, you can tell its metabolic rate, the rate at which body mass is converted into oxygen. High metabolic rate will signal hot-blooded, low metabolic rate, cold-blooded. Yeah, get a strength. Make sure it's tight. Got it? Got it. All right, let's get down. Straight to the bottom. You guys okay with that? All right. Yep, fine. Yeah. We have to weigh the turtle in order to get the relationship between its metabolic rate and its body size. Bigger animals have a lower metabolic rate than smaller animals. So if we're gonna find out what dinosaurs did, we need to know the biggest reptile, the leatherback turtle. So a 300 kilogram leatherback is about as big as we can work with. The only thing bigger is a Nile crocodile, 24 feet long, which will eat half of our investigators. So we don't work with that animal. We've got 300 kilograms, take away 10 for the net. 290 kilograms is the weight, the mass, about 625 pounds. Now we've, we've put the mask on the turtle. It's just a five gallon water jug. And we check to make sure that she can breathe freely, but that the mask is sealed. We use duct tape. Now you can, you can actually hear the air coming out. And um, we want to keep that valve in the, just keep it all down in there. We don't want sand on it. Keep it down until we're ready. I'll show you how to do it. By the next morning, two full bags of turtle breath have been collected for researcher Frank Palladino, more than enough to use for his experiment. He analyzes the turtle's breath for oxygen and carbon dioxide content. From that, he will derive the metabolic rate. That, in turn, will tell him whether the turtle is hot or cold-blooded. The results we've obtained here are very exciting and quite unique because they have shown us that although the leatherback's energy consumption is somewhat higher than we would expect for a reptile of this size, it is very unlike the large mammals such as elephants and birds that I've worked with in the past. Uh, the metabolism of these le leatherbacks is truly reptilian. But if the turtle is cold-blooded, and if dinosaurs were too, then how can they make the long journey from Alaska to warmer climates? For turtles, it may be that they can swim. But how would the dinosaurs have made the trip? The answer, says Spotilla, lies in their huge bulk. Oh. There we go. Big objects, whether they're houses or turtles, reptiles, mammals, all heat and cool slower than small objects. It's that combination of insulation and body size that accounts for it being warm. And we call that gigantothermy. And the leatherback is a great example of gigantothermy. And the only better example of gigantothermy was probably the dinosaurs. She's all set. As soon as she gets her bearings, I think she'll just walk into the water. 
The theory of gigantothermy, that an animal's sheer size helps conserve heat, suggests the dinosaurs could have had warm bodies and therefore could have had active lifestyles, even if they shared the turtle's reptilian metabolic rate. So is it finally settled? Dinosaurs were cold-blooded? Not so fast. Perhaps dinosaurs had some intermediate strategy, a body temperature higher than reptiles, but lower than mammals. Is there some other way to put the hot-blooded, cold-blooded issue to rest? Paleontologist Jack Horner. What we have here is a, a nest of baby duckbill dinosaurs, myosaurs, and an adult. And our problem is how you get from being a hatchling at 16 to 18 inches long up to an animal that's 25 or 30 feet long. We know that if we were to compare them to modern crocodiles or alligators, um, these kinds of animals grow about a foot a year. So if the dinosaurs grew like a fast reptile, they'd hatch out at 16 to 18 inches long, it would take them 20 years to get up to the size of an adult. Well, as it turns out, we have a way of determining how long it actually took, and that is by looking at the internal structure of the, of the bone itself. A series of femur bones belonging to several myosars from baby to adult gives Horner an almost direct look at a growing dinosaur. His pioneering work in bone histology, the microscopic analysis of the fossilized bone tissue, has brought surprising new facts to light. You can tell a great deal about dinosaur growth and metabolism by, by looking at the actual structure of the inside of the bone. And what we have right here is, is a thin section of the femur of a turtle. This is the exterior of the bone here. Uh, these little black areas are osteocytes. And what we're interested in are vascular canals, the, the actual spaces in which the vessels ran through the bone that carried the blood. In this particular case, we're dealing with a, with a relatively slow-growing animal and we have just a couple of, of vascular canals. If we look at the bone of a turtle, we get a picture of a cold-blooded animal's growth pattern. It's slow. Put the bone of a hot-blooded animal, a bird, under the microscope, and the picture is quite different. Vascular canals run throughout the bone, indicating high metabolism and fast pace of growth, both typical of hot-blooded animals. And now look at a bone from the baby myosar. The vascular canals show up as white. Which does it resemble, turtle or bird? As you can see, a dinosaur has dense vascularization, just like we see in birds. In fact, there's actually more vascularization than we see in some of the large birds, like ostriches and, and emus and things like that. Now, if we remember this, and now will go on to an adult dinosaur. As you can see, there's, in the adult bone, there's lots and lots of these vascular canals where the little white spots are. And what's interesting here is, the, is this dark line that you see running right down here. And that, that is an arrest line. When the animal was younger, it was growing relatively fast, and it was growing and growing and growing. And, and at this particular point, growth slowed down. And like, like us and like a lot of other animals, metabolism slows down. I mean, we do it when we're about 40 years old, and dinosaurs did it as well, but they appear to have done it when they were about four years old. For Horner, the many vascular canals and the thin arrest line settled the dispute. So the bone histology basically tells us that, that dinosaurs had relatively high pretty high metabolism, that they grew really fast, um, and that they were much more like, like birds than they were like reptiles, and were probably very active animals, like birds, and, and not sluggish like reptiles. The final word has not been spoken in this dispute. Some scientists say Horner's myosars may be a special case. But many authorities now agree with him and say, yes, 
dinosaurs were indeed warm-blooded. Migrating dinosaurs, running dinosaurs, dinosaurs as active as birds. All this new information means that our series animator, Dave Alexevich, has to keep revising his ideas in order just to keep up. For help with his stegosaur, he goes to Bob Bakker. This is the original mount from about 1920 and is still a darn good mount. You won't find another dinosaur with armor plates as big as a Stegosaurus laticeps. It's great armor and it could wiggle. Those plates could wiggle. You mean those plates could move? Yeah, yeah. Look at the way they're set in the body, just by their bottom edge, a thin edge. Just a little tug of the skin muscle and that thing's, that thing's flipping right to left. That would scare a predator. In fact, this whole animal is incredibly flexible from, from nose to, to the hips. There's no stiffening anywhere in the torso. There's no stiffening in the shoulder. That body could twist from side to side and turn itself into a U-turn. I mean, this is Mesozoic uh, martial arts with a lot of choreography. And the reason, the reason for all this choreography is at the tail end are the four uh, anti-predator spikes. Really, really sharp. Great design. Super to draw, super to animate, I'd bet. The dinosaurs that followed Stegosaurus, such as Triceratops, had totally different approaches to offense and defense. Triceratops, a uh, aggressive, charging, counterattack way of dealing with a big predator. Um, even though it's a, a plant eater, the thigh is gigantic. This is twice the girth, twice the strength of, a, of an African elephant. And the mm -hmm. shin, though short, has a massive uh, calf muscle for pushing the animal forward in a charge, in a counterattack. The front leg is massive, very powerfully muscled. The shoulder blade has, has power, again, for just driving this animal forward. And if you look under the head, you can see the ball and socket joint where the neck meets the head, just about uh -huh. at the center of gravity so that head can pivot in every yeah. direction. I need to know where that yeah, pivot show you point that. should that. It's right here, just below the eyes, and between the horns. And the muscles, then, can switch that head up and down and sideways easily. It's got to do that. Look where the eye sockets are. 
Mm -hmm. The eyes face sideways, like a rhino's. So it's scanning the horizon while it's chewing. It sees a predator. It thrusts forwards, and the neck muscles move that head up and away, mm -hmm. up and away, up and away, like a combination giant rhinoceros and Brahma bull. Here is the best reason for all that solid defense, Tyrannosaurus rex. Not every dinosaur was a peaceable grazer. Some ate meat, a lot of meat. And from Bob Bakker, our animator gets a picture of the mechanics of this bone-crushing carnivore. Right here in the power plant, we should see a gigantic set of lungs and a gigantic heart. And what, in fact, we have is this enormous spread of ribs encompassing the heart cavity and the lung cavity. This isn't the power plant of a, a, a lizard of 7,000 pounds. This is the power plant of an eagle-like predator that could run and fight and kill hour after hour without fatigue. These teeth are unusual. They're strange. They're not sharp. They're like, like great steel railroad spikes for jamming into tendon and bone and splintering backbones and killing with one tremendous crunch. So I envision a, a hunt of, of T-Rex. Let's say this young female with chicks to feed. She's out searching with those, those forwardly facing eyes, searching the landscape for a triceratops she can cut out from the herd. ideas have been taken to heart by the world's museums. Here in Toronto, Canada, they're building a dinosaur exhibit for the American Museum of Natural History in New York. Peter May builds dinosaurs for a living. Okay. Yep. You take that out. Just the front pin. In the past, mounting a fossil skeleton of solid rock 50 feet straight up in the air would have been a tricky balancing act. Let's get the humerus and see how that looks. Check the articulation on that. But now, using lightweight plastic casts, copies of the original bones, the Titan becomes almost a featherweight. Yeah, we do. If we put the ori original animal up here, it would uh, weigh probably well over a ton. And the animal that we've got is going to weigh probably three, four hundred pounds. It's going to be a very dynamic pose. And we have a pile of scientists come up today from the American Museum in New York, and it's their first look at it, and it's going to be our first look at it, and it's going to look pretty good. Well, I... Oh, you don't think so? Well, yeah, I'm working... Jack McIntosh is perhaps the world's leading sauropod expert. 
the thing is, the sternal plates that got it. The sternal plates that that Dan has out at Dinosaur National Monument, which are in place, have th this much space between them. They're, the problem they, here is the exact relationship uh, between breastbone, shoulder, and ribs. One. What'll do? This will dictate our ribs. Exactly. Uh, that's how we're going to work it okay. because it, yeah, the up there it's yeah. it so distorted. That the, it isn't the possible vertebrae. that these come down a bit further, is it? Right there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you can see what that the seems to be an articulation, right? Right here. Okay. All right. Fine. Good. And this this may have been connected in life because I mean this is sure. definitely a cartilage sure. surface. Sure. 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 So. Sure. That looks good. Okay, I, that looks good to me. In December 1991, the new construction opened in New York City at the American Museum of Natural History. Paleontologist Mark Norell. Well, when we decided to put them out together, we wanted to have something that represented some of the new thoughts about dinosaurs, as opposed to the way mounts have traditionally been made. What visitors see is a slice in time from about 150 million years ago. A mother barasar rears up on the huge pillars of her hind legs to defend the baby crouched behind her tail. The threat comes from an allosaur, a meat-eating dinosaur with razor-sharp fangs. The barasar has only its huge bulk and the small front legs for weapons. Savage claws and speed favor the allosaur. I think that it represents something very dynamic, and it really gets the idea across that dinosaurs were living animals that had very active lifestyles, very much like modern living animals do. The mount itself has been the subject of considerable debate. Is this true science? How much did barasars care about their young? And even if they wanted to protect them, could they have done it like this? Rearing up on their hind legs? So of course the fossils don't tell us that they could actually do this, but they don't tell us they couldn't do it either. So what this represents is something just speculative, something to capture your imagination. Here at the museum, science and imagination have merged. Science needs imagination. It is more than a matter of putting bones together like so many tinker toys. This exhibit could have been assembled only by a coalition of science, informed guesswork, and creativity. That creativity has been pushed to its limits in recent years, as scientists have used every weapon in their armory to pierce the most intimate secrets of the dinosaur's life. How they ate, how they digested, how they reared their young, and how they died. Tomorrow night on The Dinosaur. I knew that if we were going to tell the story of the origin of dinosaurs, we had to come here. We can look at his jaws and imagine the great gulps of flesh it could have taken from the thigh of Desmatosuchus, whatever. What's striking about the fossils we find here is the incredible low diversity of species. I thought to myself, something's here. And Bob picked up a little dentary with teeth in it, and he looked at it, and he, his mouth fell open, and he said, you're right, Jack, this is a baby dinosaur. <laughs>
Tomorrow night at 8 o'clock, be sure to join us for part three of the dinosaurs, The Nature of the Beast. That's tomorrow at 8 p.m. Right now, we'd like to know what you think about tonight's episode of the series, so stay tuned for a special telephone number to call with your thoughts. And that's followed at 9 o'clock by the Amish, not to be modern, all coming up here on TV 12.